Hey, g'day, it's your old mate Prezzo here, and this is episode number 11 of the Stuart number 8 mill engine build. And I seriously believe this is going to be the last episode in this very long saga. As it turned out though, the work involved in actually prepping and finishing and assembling and testing this engine took way longer than I imagined and I wanted to film all of that process. So what you see before you are the individual parts all ready to go together. I have had the engine running and uh, that took uh, several days of assembling, tearing down, finding the, uh, the problems with fit and rectifying those, putting the engine back together again and so on. I also want this engine to be a static display model. Uh, I'm building it for a friend and the kit of castings came from his father. So I wanted to also make a nameplate uh, for the display base and this brass uh, plaque you can see here has the name of the person that gave me the set of castings. The timber base here is uh, just simply a way of displaying the model. I don't imagine this engine is ever going to do any serious work with steam. It's probably going to run as a demonstration model on compressed air. So I want it to be uh, finished in such a way that it's, it looks like a display model. Now I know that there are about 30 people who watch this series and uh, to be honest I had big classes when I was teaching secondary school. But at the end of the day if there are 30 people who are interested in what I'm doing, well that's a good thing. So let's sit up straight and pay attention. There's going to be a test on this at the end of the week. Gotchquinta, put your phone away. Croker and Fenner, are you late again? No, Tony, you cleaned the blackboard last week. Now come on, let's get busy. One of the first things that I would need before I could test this engine was a set of gaskets. Uh, these would help to seal off the pressure areas in the engine. Once I had digitized the drawings, it was a simple matter to cut out multiple gaskets for each of the joints. The first set that I made were from a sort of parchment photocopy paper, and although they cut very cleanly and they fitted perfectly, they just simply were too thin to compress when the joints were bolted down tight. I cut a duplicate set from a proper oil jointing gasket material and these were much more successful. I did cut way more than what I needed, just as a set of spares as well. One thing that I found out very early was that you do need to hold this material down. I used a piece of steel plate on the honeycomb bed of the laser and a set of small magnets to hold the material and keep it still. You also have to turn the blower off, uh, otherwise it just blows the bits and pieces in front of the laser as it cuts. Well, here you can see a gratuitous video montage as I attempt to get the engine running. This involved lots and lots of assembly and disassembly, and even though individual components were machined to the published dimensions, it doesn't always mean they're going to fit nicely. So. In individual components were tried and fitted, uh, disassembled and sometimes remachined, but eventually the engine did go together and was running on compressed air. Once I was satisfied that I had the engine running as I wanted it to, the next step was to completely disassemble the engine. Each individual part was stripped and all of the fasteners removed and stored ready for the reassembly later. Because I had used so much oil during the running in process, I now had to clean all of the individual parts. I did this with a engine degreasing solution, scrubbing with a toothbrush, and then rinsing with water. The final cleaning process before a powder coat is always to scrub the parts with ordinary Ajax cleaner and a toothbrush. The Ajax does an excellent job of degreasing the surface, but it also activates it, which means that any paint process you do after that is going to bond atomically to the substrate. This gives you a, a much, much better uh, finish, and also it means that the finish is going to stay on and be chip resistant.
One of the things that I like to do in any of my finished projects is to fit brass nameplates. Now this process I'm showing you is not mine, it's something that I found on somebody else's YouTube channel. I've not shown the process for doing the resist because that's been covered by lots and lots of other people. The one that I'm using here is a photo resist dry film which is very easy to apply. You just need a laser printer and also a laminator which is used to heat the brass plate and also the photo resist. The uh, material is floated in uh, ferric chloride which is actually what does the etching. The foam that I've attached to the back of the brass plate helps the material to float and stop it sitting on the bottom of the glass dish. To remove the photo resist, you just use caustic soda mixed with water and that dissolves away the remaining photo resist. It only takes about five minutes for the resist to loosen and once you see it floating uh, you can take out the brass plate and wash it in water. I used Corel Draw to design the artwork for this plaque and I took the trouble to draw in the whole centres before I printed out the artwork on overhead transparency film. Cutting the plate to its finished profile is done using a combination of the belt linisher and just hand files in the vise. Getting the little rounds on the ends correct is uh, not easy and it's a bit that everyone looks at and if you get them wrong it sticks out a mile. Now you can just paint these brass plates with acrylic or enamel paint and when it's set hard you just simply trim off the high spots using wet and dry or emery. I prefer to powder coat but just because I can and also it's way more durable than ordinary paint. The enamel will stick for a while but as the brass corrodes underneath, especially if you don't get an even coverage, it will start to bubble and lift. Powder coat by contrast is pretty much permanent. You can see that I'm sticking the brass plate to a piece of uh, wood just as a handle and I've got four different grades of wet and dry uh, paper on this glass plate and it's just a matter of rubbing the surface and checking. Uh, you'll see when the brass is starting to appear through the powder coat and you've got to be a little bit vigilant depending on how deep you've cut your etching. Uh, the deeper the better basically and that gives you a little bit more latitude when you are cutting back the high spots. So the last step in this process is to powder coat the finished plaque and this protects the exposed brass and keeps it from corroding as well. I'm using a super wet clear which gives it a beautiful protection finish, very very glossy. For the timber base I decided to use a piece of New Guinea rosewood. This is a rainforest timber from New Guinea obviously and it has a beautiful ripple pattern in it but it does make it very difficult to plane. Uh, no matter which direction you cut from, you're nearly always cutting against the grain. The splayed feature that I'm putting on the front of this is where I'm going to mount the finished brass plaque. Because the grain is so interlocked in this material about the only way you can finish this is with a scraper. 
I went and sharpened the scraper so that I was getting very, very fine shavings off the surface. And because of the geometry and the way that it cuts, it doesn't tend to tear up the grain. The final process was done with a random orbit sander and then finishing by hand. I used 600 grit paper to do the finished sanding on this and I'll tell you what, it was a really hot day when I was doing this. Um, certainly up around about the mid 30s at Celsius for you North American people. So, um, yep, not very pleasant. When you are doing this finished sanding, uh, one of the most important things is to pay attention to the corners and the very ends of the piece. They tend to be the parts that you overlook. I'll be finishing the timber base using a sanding sealer followed by a wattle pre-catalyzed lacquer top coat. The nails that I'm putting in here are just simply so that I can paint the underside and then immediately flip it over and do the top. This really just speeds up the drying process. You can tell when these lacquers are ready for the sanding process they will feel warm to the touch. That's because all of the thinner has evaporated off and that cooling process as the thinners evaporate will have dissipated. You do need to use a flexible sanding block when you're doing this so you don't rock away the, the high spots or the corners and then wiping off the dust afterwards is essential. Just from memory, I think I used about four or five coats of sanding sealer to completely fill the grain on this piece. This is the final sanding before I decided to go to the top coat. I'm using a flexible sanding block so there's no chance you're going to cut through the high spots of the corners. I follow up with steel wool, uh, very fine steel wool, and rub that with the grain and that gives a semi-polished finish. The top coat that I'm using here is a 60% gloss. I didn't really want that super high gloss finish. One thing you do have to be careful of in very humid weather is uh, the lacquer absorbing moisture out of the air as the thinner evaporates off the surface. If you get that sort of milky appearance to it, it's quite difficult to remove that and get a clear coat. The engine base casting and the steam chest had a few defects in them and I wanted to fill those before I powder coated each of those parts. I'm using a, an epoxy product here, this one uh, is marketed as looking like steel and behaving like steel, it's got a lot of metallic powder in it. Now a lot of people tell you that you cannot powder coat over anything that's non-metallic. Now I've done this before and I can tell you now it does work. The powder coating process is use a, an electrostatic charge, not an electric charge. So you can actually put powder coat on non-metallic surfaces. So in this case, I've just plastered this stuff all over the defects and yep, it's very hard to get off your hands. When that was thoroughly dry, I think I waited till the next day, we simply file off the excess and then hand sand that to blend it into the, the finished surface of the casting.
This is where the gland fits into the end of the steam chest and the profile is meant to be elliptical but uh, there was some material missing from the casting and uh, it was necessary to fill that up and here I'm just simply trying to recreate that profile with a square file and a half round file and it blended in quite nicely so I'm quite happy with the result. Powder coating process requires that you mask off any areas that you don't want powder coat to be uh, applied to during the finishing process. So the outer face of the flywheel and the edges of the flywheel are obvious places where I didn't want that powder coat to go. The tape that I'm using here is a sort of a heat proof fiberglass woven tape. Uh, it takes the temperature of the oven quite well. It does sometimes delaminate but by that time usually the powder coat has been done and it's just simply going through the final curing process in the oven. It's just a bit of a pain to, to attach it to all of these parts and you do need to burnish the tape down quite hard once you cut it to size. It's also not very flexible, so if you're trying to wrap it around a curved edge like I'm doing here, you just got to do it in short sections and then trim off the excess with a sharp blade. This is the lower cylinder cover and this uh, face that I'm covering up here now will have a gasket fitted to it later so it's definitely an area I didn't want powder coat to go. The finished powder coat is actually much thicker than ordinary paint and uh, for that reason I didn't want any powder coat to go in this area where the bearing brass will fit. They're essentially a sliding fit and even the tiniest trace of powder coat would stop them going in. So once again, it's just a lot of tedious taping that needs to be done. It certainly saves time later though. This stainless steel wire serves several purposes. It allows you to form the electrical connection between the powder coating power source and the part. It also serves to allow the parts to hang in the oven while they bake and it means that you can handle the parts without touching the powder coating. This piece of hardwood now was coated in wax and pushed up into the bore where the crosshead will operate and it was just an easy way of blanking this off so that I wouldn't get any powder into this area. The engine base was done in a satin black powder coat and I also did the uh, cladding or the cleating for the cylinder in the same powder. It just makes it easier to do all the parts with the same colour at the same time. The actual clean up is very simple. It's just a matter of uh, blowing out the excess powder from the cup and the gun with compressed air. This is my powder coating oven, it's a, just a domestic oven that's been reconfigured uh, with a PID controller so I can set the temperature to 200 degrees centigrade. Here's a tip, don't do it in the kitchen oven, the wife tends to get very upset when you do that and um, quite frankly uh, we don't need to go there. The 
flywheel was done with the same gloss thread that I used for the brass plug and the silicon rubber plug you can see that's been pushed into the bore there was an accessory that came with the powder coating kit. These plugs are reusable and uh, they just keep powder out of areas where you don't want it to go. The gloss level that I got from this red powder was a bit disappointing and I ended up clear coating that part later. All the rest of the parts were done with a colour called Hawthorne Green and here you can see me doing the steam chest cover. Because there were several of these parts to be done all the same colour, I stockpiled these on a piece of square steel bar, which is the correct width to go into the oven, so that um, once I had all the powder on the parts, I could put the whole lot in the oven at the same time. This just makes it a lot easier to get the timing correct. The timing is basically about how long it takes for the powder to fuse and becomes glossy. Once that glossy coating appears, uh, most powders take between 10 to 15 minutes baking at 200 degrees C before they're cured. You can take them out of the oven uh, as soon as they go glossy, but they won't achieve the correct strength that the powder coating will achieve if you leave it in for the correct time. So here you can see all the parts going in at the same time. This is uh, not an easy operation. You've got to be extremely careful that you don't bump it on anything. Even a gust of wind is enough to blow the powder off the part before it gets baked in the oven. So here are the same parts after they've cooled in the oven. I know I'm grabbing it with a pair of pliers, but in fact uh, it was only just warm at this stage. Well, here we are back at the lathe. I'm making some flanges that are going to be used to connect the steam and exhaust pipes to the engine. Uh, I've really got to learn how to set the uh, manual focus on this camera. What I've worked out is that the autofocus on this Sony camera is so good that it follows the chips as they come off the parts. So these flanges really are just purely decorative. They're going to be drilled and tapped to fit the steam inlet pipe and the exhaust pipe. I also drilled a series of four holes around the, the flange uh, using the indexing attachment on my Colchester lathe. Once again these holes are just decorative, they're not really going to be attached to anything. I've decided to fit the flange to the quarter inch copper exhaust pipe using CA adhesive. Could have silver soldered it, but it's really just a, a replica, so it's not going to do any serious work with steam. The next step was to create a sort of a simulated lagging on these pipes. Now, engines of this type would normally have an asbestos covering to insulate the pipe. Uh, of course, if you mention the word asbestos these days, people panic and run for the hills. So what I'm using here is uh, black shoelaces. Now, asbestos is grey or white, so you're probably questioning why I'm using black shoelaces. But uh, to be honest, I just couldn't be bothered going to the shop to get white ones. I had some black ones in the cupboard, so that's what I used.
here I'm using the same CA adhesive to bond the shoelace to the copper pipe. It's just a matter of um, being patient and making sure that you get a, a good bond at the beginning and the end. Uh, the rest of the pipe is just simply wrapped and it's not bonded at all. At the ends, it's just a matter of cutting the, the lace to a sort of a taper so that it makes a neat joint at the end. The CA makes the ends of the pipe quite rigid and if you do get a bit of overlap, you can sand or file off the excess later to make it look neat at these uh, critical ends. Uh, before I was mentioning about how asbestos was used as a lagging on steam pipes and when I was uh, going to college and studying to become a teacher, I worked as a volunteer at the Brisbane Maritime Museum. They had a warehouse there with shelving probably 14 to 15 feet high and it was stacked with sections of asbestos lagging that was used on steam pipes. And if you walked in there at the right time of the day with the sun shining through the high windows in the warehouse, you could see the dust streaming down from the shelving. Like I said, today people would panic. Uh, there'd be, you know, hazmat teams in there before you knew it. Back in the day though, no one seemed to worry about it. So once the CA adhesive had set on the copper pipe, I could clean up the ends of the pipe by sanding and filing, just to make it look neat. The next step in this process was to simulate the look of asbestos. Now you didn't think I was going to leave this looking black did you? So what I did then was I found some white uh, water based primer paint and I was able to coat the black surface with the white paint. This did a pretty thorough job and I was surprised actually that it covered the, the black cloth so easily. I did end up doing two coats and I sanded between coats but the end result is a pretty close approximation of what an asbestos lagging would look like. So here is the finished steam inlet pipe and the exhaust pipe with their simulated lagging attached and sadly I'm going to have to leave the assembly of these parts to the next episode. This video is already getting up toward the 35 minute mark and as you know you can measure people's attention spans these days in milliseconds so uh, I think another one hour video is not really going to cut it so let's leave it here and wind this up now and in the next episode you're going to see the full assembly of the engine and the running I promise. So until then Thanks for watching.